So good morning, uh, everyone. So um, we're going to discuss the paper, uh, one, one of the, the case study about Colombia. That was the material we were given to discuss. Uh, next slide, please. This is going to be the structure of our presentation. And we're going to start with a quick recap. Next slide. And well, just remember, it's a demand-led CFC model that's used to identify a, a pathway. Uh, and the shock is the exports of fossil fuels. Uh, the shock is chosen because of Colombia's dependency on it for its balance sheet. And the novelty, and it's a great innovation and a great thing, strong part about the paper, is a really good, well, treatment of the external part on balance of payments, the financial flows, and etc. And the policy implication is that Colombia should diversify its export. It's going to be a bad scenario if the fossil fuel exports go down. Go. And now we're going to start with the first discussion about the investment function. Uh, why are we talking about investment function? Well, investment function is very important for long-term output. It, it determines capacity and the ongoing debates in post-Keynesian literature. Uh, regarding all the other behavioral equations in the model, we found them very uh, realistic and they follow empirical regularities of Colombia. So one of them is assumed that the Central Bank of Colombia follows very closely a Taylor rule that some post-Keynesians could say, ah, that's very naive, maybe the Central Bank has different rules, but there's papers that say they follow it very orthodoxly. And one could still point out to lacks of autonomous consumption, that dynamics, but one has to cut something when they do a model. So it's okay. Go on. So the investment function in the model is model uh, is in the following way. So that's what's in the model. R is the real rate of uh, the nominal rate of profit minus inflation. And since there's no traverse to a normal capacity utilization, it somewhat suggests for us a new Klet's conclusion. And our question is how much different would the, the pathway simulated be with a different output closure? Can you go? So we're gonna give an example with the super Zraffian multiplier, which is uh, just a suggestion, it could be any different closure, having thousands of investment functions. But let's go through it. So in this, the special thing about super Zraffian multiplier models is that all of investment is induced by, by income. And it's dependent on autonomous expenditures. So in the model, you would see year by year the growth rate falling because one of the components of autonomous demand which is the change in time of exports of fossil fuel will continually fall. Uh, and there is another distinction on transmission channels between a uh, super Zraffian closure, uh, which is the one about uh, the continuous uh, depreciation of the exchange rate, where since we have the, the profit share in the investment function, because you can open up a rate of profit, it's a share of profit capacity utilization and the, the, vehicle, the capacity to output ratio, uh, you can find uh, more impacts negatively onto the, the investment, investment part. So, and now I'll pass the word to the next presenter, which is Mer Chauvin. So now we're gonna enter, sorry. We're gonna enter in the Columbia framework to discuss uh, how's the challenges, uh, as Professor Godin uh, pointed, uh, there's a lot of challenges in if Colombia continue with uh, the oil exports that they have in the two scenarios that they simulated. The one is uh, the global transition the, and the conservative one. Uh, this is one of uh, some of the, the challenges is low down economic growth and increase in employment in the medium term, increase of inflation rate, fiscal deficit, public debt levels and risk premiums over the long term, permanent currency depreciation, and consequently a fall in international reserves. Uh, that's also what literature uh, talks about. Commodity dependency is also associated with uh, political instability, amplification of the negative effects of climate change, poor governance, lower social development, lower human development, and lower non-resources for diversification. Uh, so what's the way out to like, how Colombia can pass through that? And as the paper and Godin also pointed, it's important to reduce import dependency, to um, try to avoid the, the graph that Godin pointed of uh, per capita income, uh, increase the export base with more sophisticated, higher value added goods and services, diversify the exports, and also guarantee a constant flow, interactions, entries, coordinating actions between industry, finance, and government in the long term is not only about economics. Col Colombia has a um, 
structure and framework really difficult to try to diversify the reports how we get there. So, as also uh, Godon pointed, um, Colombia's commodity dependency, according to Jungtad, in 2021, it's 19, the rate is 99%. They define a commodity dependency country if you have more than 60% of your exports, exports in commodities. And basically, no, wait. And basically, uh, Colombia has uh, metals, uh, oil, of course, agriculture. This is chemicals, but really simple ones, not um, high added values. Um, textiles, and these three smallest one is basically we can call manufacturing because it's uh, mechanicals, cars, and electronics, I think. But it's not even 3% of the exportion, so Colombia has a really, uh, sorry, <laughs> Colombia has a really difficult, um, like challenging to, basically they have to develop since the beginning a uh, industrial park to try to, uh, developing you know, device for exports uh, out of commodities based. But historically, we know that uh, more diversification, you can see it's um, related to greenhouse gas emissions. But if you're talking about a green transition um, framework as the paper, we can diversify the economy of Colombia. They can diversify their economy with uh, full fossils. So it's even harder because that was the, these countries did. The, I don't know if you can read, but that's other countries. This is the commodity dependent developing countries, which is Colombia and mostly Latin American countries. Um, other challenges is the competition. Of course, Colombia has to pass through a structural change with low carbon paths, or at least try to be low carbon path, and succeed to be competitive with economies who already have a development and technological industrial framework, like US, China, it's really hard, and uh, here we are assuming that Colombia is participating in the global transition. It's not only reacting to the decline in global oil demand, so they need to also put in like effort to as also be green. And other coal-dependent countries and oil-dependent countries is also seek new sports markets because they're also facing the global transition. This scenario. Uh, another alternative is, will be the, for the global transition will be a result of diversification. Instead of oil, you can uh, invest in the raw materials critical for global transitions. Uh, neighboring countries like Bolivia, Peru, and Chile hold the significant market shares on that kind of project. Uh, the discussion in Colombia is um, incipient but has potential. They can try on it, but we have to face. Uh, we have to think about this to really. Uh, challenging problems. One is the ecological impact and also the risk of remaining in a commodity dependent framework because you still have to face the challenges of being a commodity country with these materials. And finally, uh, that's what Colombia is uh, putting efforts. If you read the, the state documents, uh, they're putting effort and change the consumer pattern in the domestic market because they know, as um, Professor Godin also pointed, uh, in a couple of seven years, I think, they uh, maybe uh, have to import oil. So they're trying to change that in the domestic market, but not, uh, they don't mention basically like large structural changes regarding to the oil exports basket. And also really important, the, um, they have a really, really rancher elite, as um, mostly it's a trend in Latin America. So it's really d difficult to uh, face that. It's deeply rooted in, uh, deeply rooted uh, in the country. So it's also like makes things even harder. Now I'll pass the floor for the third. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, as a last point, we wanted to bring up that um, yeah, Colombia will be also heavily impacted by climate change. So it's a really di like it's a country with a really diverse geography. So you're gonna have different impacts across regions. So in some regions, you're gonna have some flooding. You will have uh, sea level rise, but also some droughts. Really depending where you are. And um, according to the World Bank. Um, 86 of its assets are in areas exposed to two or more hazards. So we can definitely state um, that the Colombian economy will be impacted by it. And um, yeah, we didn't really find that in the paper. So 
um, yeah, usually when we talk about risks, um, we have two types of risks. So the transition risks, which is obviously the focal point of the paper. So um, yeah, basically the transition, the green transition, but then the physical risks, uh, they're missing. So yeah, what, uh, for example, a flood, how it would impact the economy. And um, yeah, we just believe it could have also really important macroeconomic influences. And um, yeah, we're therefore wondering if it would be possible to include some sort of damage function. There are like some approaches on it where there are some stock flow models uh, which insert a damage function into the model. And yeah, of course, we are aware it's not so easy because um, yeah, especially when it comes to all the tipping points and so on. But still, we wanted to point that out. And as a second point, um, I think you also mentioned that before. It's um, obviously really also related to what kind of sector we look at when we talk about climate change impacts. And um, yeah, despite being the like the agriculture sector is at the moment not the most important sector, but especially if um, yeah all the oil exports are phased out, agriculture could actually become really, really important and um, would at the same time also be heavily impacted by climate change. And yeah, we were just wondering if um, yeah, there could be some work done to develop an extra model, but I think you mentioned that before already. Uh, yeah, inspired by the Tunisian model, the AFD developed where um, yeah, it would be discussed how climate change would impact the agriculture output, but also which kind of adaptation policies would impact that and also then overall how it would affect the whole economy. And yeah, here we just have all our questions sum up and thank you very much. All right, it, I should, is it, I unmuted it, so, yeah, all right, perfect. Um, should I respond to the discussion first and then, thanks, um, very interesting, and I think you pointed out some of the, well, limitation of the model, of course, and as, as you know, uh, choosing is renouncing, so uh, you can't model everything, but, uh, but on the other hand, uh, yeah, so, so, uh, 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 some of the points you were mentioning. So on the investment function, um, actually it's, it's a very important question that, and we haven't finished. Uh, we, we're working on this. Uh, we're not happy with the, with the, the, the current specification. Um, I'm not sure we're going to go to the Sraf and super multiplier, but uh, we could talk. I mean, the, the, the difficulty, and let me try to, to explain, and I think it's an interesting discussion we could have. So fundamentally, investment takes place, one, because it is expected to be profitable and so this is what we had in the model we had like the investment depends on the profit rate minus inflation the real profit rate so how much you actually make by investing but on the same time it is profitable but the question is it, it has to be expected profitable so you have to take into consideration the fact that maybe when you invest you also want to increase your capacity and you want to make sure that as you increase your capacity you actually can sell it and so this is why using the current profit rate is a bit problematic because that's, it doesn't say anything about whether if you expand your production function, your production capacities, maybe you won't be able to sell them. So, so that's one issue. The second point is that in the current specification, there is no role for you, the capacity utilization rate. And again, uh, you could have situation where you, you still invest because you expect it to be profitable, but then you don't use all of the capital you're making, which would be completely stupid. So, so what we're trying to do right now is to build some sort of a expected profitability. So, ex a, sorry, it's it's a difficult concept. So, it's the how much you want you to increase your production, taking into consideration the profitability of expanding the produ the production. So, you say, okay, I want to increase my production based on how much I think I can sell, and based on how much margin I'm making. Like, how profitable is it to expand my production? So that means you can have like some sort of an a targeted uh, production decision, so how much I want to produce given how much I can, pr I can sell or I expect to sell and how much profitable it is. And then once you have your expected or targeted production, then you can compute what kind of capital you would need to be able to produce that, taking into consideration the utilization rate. 
And then you have the entire story because then you is there, but in a technical way, and then profitability is there and expected sales is there. So that's what we're trying to do. We, we're working on this specification and uh, we'll do that, but then I'll make sure to send you the paper so maybe you can comment on it. Um, Exports, uh, of course, I mean, we know it's a very big, uh, uh, it's difficult. It's, it's extremely difficult. We talked and all of what you said is, is, is there, indeed. So it's difficult to export. You have to diversify without increasing your CO2 emission. Um, yeah, we could talk about the green transition uh, opportunity. We looked at, in a, in a different project with Colombia, we looked at whether Colombia would be um, profit or would be competitive on green hydrogen. You know, like whenever there's a problem about exports, ah, oh, green hydrogen. And green hydrogen is complicated to produce. First, I don't think there's a, such a demand, uh, but that's a different discussion. But then it's actually complicated to produce. And so we looked at, in the current situation, Colombia would not be competitive. You'd need the price of green hydrogen to be 20% higher than what it is actually, what it is, it is expected to be for Colombia to be actually uh, uh, profitable. Um, so, so yeah, it's difficult. The, the green transition materials, that sounds awfully like what we've been doing for the last 30 years. Yeah, you know, Africa will develop because it has, renew it, it has critical material or material critical for the green transition. We've been doing this for the last 30 years. Africa has been rich with tons of material and still hasn't been able to develop completely. Same goes in Latin America. So the question is, yeah, you have resources, but you want to make sure that the value added out of these resources stays domestically, which implies industrialization. And that's difficult because it implies you have to build capital stock, you have to import technologies at first and then be able to do innovation on these technologies. And to me, this is where I think UNCTAD is brilliant because it, it mentions patent distribution or technological transfer. It means serious financial uh, support and not making money out of it, but making sure that, that you have domestic de uh, development of industries and so on and so forth. So, so that it, it also implies having an industri industrial policy. And that's not a bad word. It's not an insult to say that I'm doing an industrial policy. And you distinguish it from the trade. You don't say it's the Ministry of Trade and Industry. No, it's the Ministry of Industry. And maybe you have trade, but it's about developing capacity to produce, not in a market competition. And that's where Com Colombia is in, a, is in a more difficult situation because it's OECD member. So it will not be eligible to official development aid. It will not be able to implement too many uh, import substitution or domestic market protection mechanism because they are supposed to be part of OECD. And so as such, they will have to fight against European countries or the US on a market-based solution when they don't have the industry to do so. So I think Colombia in that, in that case might have been a bit too fast in joining OECD. Even though it has the income, it doesn't have the infrastructure to do so. Such is life. Um, and yeah, the social aspect, I mean, yeah, we could talk for hours about the social class structure in, in Colombia. It's, it's hours of discussion. Very interesting, but not, not, not now. Um, climate change impact, yes, of course. Um, yeah, so we decided not to do it because it was complicated. The problem of Colombia is that the interannual variability of climate is larger than the intra-annual variability of climate. The problem is that Colombia has El Nino, La Nina phenomenon happening. Um, it has a very diversified geographical uh, situation, so you cannot have a climate change impact in Colombia because it depends on whether you are on the Caribbean Sea, on the ocean, or in the mountains. And so, so it's difficult to have one damage function for Colombia. Um, so, so with Jan and his master's dissertation, he's going to add agriculture in that model. <laughs> it's him there, yeah. <laughs> He's a co-author, yeah, yeah, he's a co-author of that paper, that's true. Um, uh, and so that's a lot of work we can do. Damage function, I am personally very critical of macroeconomically driven damage function. You have to go at the sectorial level. You have to understand whether your climate is going to destroy your agriculture, it's going to have impact on your energy production, it's going to have to impact on your industry or whatnot. Because I mean, first of all, the, the typical specification damage, uh, GDP loss is a function of temperature plus temperature square. I mean, you should stop doing this. No one should do that. That's just wrong. Um, that's one thing. Then you could still do, okay, but what about agriculture? And so you go down the sectoral level, and then you have to understand how the industrial structure will 
respond to the shock. So, so if you have, say, a loss of production in agriculture, how will it impact, as we do in, 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 in Tunisia, how does it impact uh, food industry? Or how does it impact tourism? How does it impact uh, your export? So you want to understand the multiplier effect that comes out of a shock in a specific sector and how it propagates either uh, upwards or downwards in the value chain to other sectors. And that's quite complicated, but it's possible. It requires you to seriously think about, OK, let's look at the different impacts that climate change from a biophysical perspective does. How does it reduce your energy production, your agricultural production? How does, how does you cope with droughts or flooding and so on and so forth? And then rebuild from a bio, biophysical perspective the indirect effect you would have on the economy and then think, is it going to have inflationary effect? Is it going to have supply constraint effect? Are you going to have to import more? Are you going to have to export less? And so on and so forth. So think about all of the economic consequences and not just say, oh, temperature, bim, GDP. And in, in all of these, and by the way, in all of these macro fun damage function, there is no inflationary process, which is, again, it's completely stupid. If you think about it, most of the damage will have inflationary process. And in all of these general equilibrium models, there is no inflation. There's relative inflation between prices, but there is no general inflation. And this is why no one saw what the Ukraine war was, would do in Europe, because it's inflationary and it stays. So, of course, if I say this in a developing economy, I say, well, inflation is important. Everyone will agree. In Europe, it's still complicated to justify. So, yeah, but anyway, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I kept the slide, so I will, I will go deeper. And, and there were lots of interesting citations and references, so I'll, I, will, I will keep them. Uh, and thanks a lot for your, for your comments. And I guess we can go to questions. Yeah. Here. It was there. Yeah, I don't know. Um, thanks. Uh, Siwar from Peru. Uh, I have three questions. Uh, which industries did you consider for the diversification of Colombia's export uh, basket? Um, where do the funds come from to fund these uh, infant industries? And is the industrialization strategy oriented to develop internal markets or is it export-led? Okay, we, we take maybe two or, two or three people. Not yeah, yeah, yeah. Question. Okay. <coughs> Uh, hello, I have more of a, uh, first of all, thank you, uh, sorry, uh, my name is Cara and I'm from Austria. Uh, thank you very much, it was super interesting. I have more of a technical question regarding the goods market disequilibrium and that you use both price adjustments and uh, quantity adjustments as well. First of all, I wondered if you could maybe go a bit of into the argumentation why you're doing this and also if that makes so much more sense why uh, mainstream models but also heterodox models usually, not always, but usually choose one or the other, and what's the rationale there, maybe? Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Max from Germany. Um, like, one uh, graph that is not going out of my head, uh, it's like uh, the difference, the main difference between energy transitions between neoclassical models and like more post keynesian inspired models that neoclassical models, they say that first you have like resource diversion or crowding out and you have like a drop in GDP. So they see especially the costs of transition. And, and, and like if you go from a post keynesian model, then the energy transition is accompanied by an increase in GDP because you have so much investment in front. And I wanted to ask you like, has, has this policy advice by neoclassical saying, okay, first you have to go like through a, like, like there are no benefits to climate mitigation. There's only costs. Has this had like real policy impact? Have you been able to observe that? Like uh, has this set back uh, efforts to do climate mitigation? That's my question. You can already answer this. I have five hours, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> you have a two, one or two additional round of questions. OK. Um, all right, so, so the very precise question about industrialization and so on. We didn't do any of these questions. It was just the magic wand. <laughs> we are working on this right now because it's a really important question indeed. So, so we knew. We just said, OK. I mean, the problem is that when you write this kind of paper, and the, the, the results are depressive. And you just like, you know, it's like, and, and you're going to the partners in Colombia and you're talking to the Ministry of Finance and you say, you know what, you're doomed. You can't really say that, can you? So we had, no, I'm kidding. 
But no, we had to. So, so far, we, di we didn't consider this. So, so no, I know that Colombia is aware of this, and, and they have started to. So, I'll, I'll answer in terms of what Colombia is considering, not what we considered in the model, because in the model we just assume that the export uh, propensity will increase, and so, and we just assume uh, we we tested uh, whether it was privately funded and publicly funded, and what we see is that when it's privately funded, it has a slightly higher multiplier at the beginning, but in the long run, uh, the public fun uh, publicly financed uh, is 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 more efficient in terms of economic growth and so on. So forth but it's really marginal and I don't think we should do a, a lot of a sensitivity analysis on this because it's we didn't even think about what kind of industry now what kind of industry did they think about um, in the case of Colombia it's uh, one it's reducing the import uh, of um, so it's not really export diversification it's import substitution and especially in the food industry Colombia is importing a lot of food which it shouldn't I mean it can produce anything if you anything you plant in Colombia will grow so 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 that's one of the aspects. Two is tourism. I don't know how much they can do it. Also, because tourism is going to be very CO2 intensive, because there is no I mean, little roads, so so it's flying between cities, which is not necessarily the, the good solution. And then there's um, electricity or e-fuel, so green hydrogen. I said green hydrogen. I don't think it's it's relevant, but electricity might be. Uh, Colombia is actually quite well connected uh, to to uh, Central America. Uh, also to Peru actually, uh, and they could, uh, and because their electricity mix is quite uh, decarboned, uh, so they have like uh, hydro for 80% and then a bit of uh, PV, so they could expand their electricity production and export that. And having a, that's, that's one possibility. Um, but then you would have to do a much more a product uh, product based uh, uh, product based analysis to try to understand where are the potential growth in terms of industrialization, because this is really where I mean, they don't produce complex goods, fundamentally. So this is where they would have to, to, to think about it. But so we didn't really respond to that. Um, to, to answer to the question, so ex ante, what I think is important, um, I think they need more than export diversification is import substitution. Um, um, and uh, industrialization has to go also towards export-led because there is a balance of payment constraint very strong in Colombia. So, 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 because currently they are importing a lot, at least for the beginning, they will have to have some sort of a exports uh, uh, led. Um, there is a potential domestic growth, very important because it's extremely unequal. So, if you think about it, uh, you could have a reduction of the extreme high income uh, consumption, but but then the potential for the growth on the lower end of the income distribution is massive. So you could also have a lot of, and that's part of the import, the, uh, import substitution, is you want to avoid having to import all of the basic goods that uh, the, the, the poorer part of the income distribution would start consuming if they were to, to have a, a re-equilibration of the inequality. So I think it's really, I mean, yeah, so it's, it's both of a dual answer. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Um, quantity price. So why... Again, so, so to me, the, I, I, I try to explain the idea of what we're doing is we want to understand, to understand what is driving the <laughs> dynamics of, once you have this equilibrium, the outcome of it, okay? In, 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 in mainstream discrete time or in post keynesian discrete time, they don't explain why, they just say what happens at the end of the period, right? So when you take a typical SFC model, they will say, okay, in period A, and then this is what happens, and then in the next period, this is what happened in the period. They don't explain why. We wanted to understand what, why. And the reason we're doing this is because we are convinced that fundamentally, it's all about the structural dynamics that will come. So you want to have a model that is capable of saying, Let's say the commodity market is moving slowly and it's mostly responding by price. And the industrial, uh, I mean, yeah, industry maybe is more about uh, quantity movement and not so much about price because it's exposed to international prices so it cannot move and so on. So we wanted to have a model that allowed us to have in a multi sectorial uh, setup uh, the dual dynamics and where in the end the income distribution story is really about how, because if, if you think about it, quantity will lead to employment dynamics, price will lead to income distribution dynamics. Yeah? Because when your price moves faster than your wages, then, then you change your income distribution. And so we wanted to have both dynamics taking place at the same time and see that depending on which one goes faster and in which industry, the overall exposed realization depends on, on these uh, intrinsic dynamics. I don't know if I'm making, I'm being clear. 
And this is why you have to do the two. If, you, if you're doing only one or the other, you're basically excluding yourself from being able to even test it. Um, and so why do uh, heterodox and mainstream? I don't know, uh, because it's easier. I mean, fundamentally, if you think about it, when you have this kind of large scale complex model, the Colombian model has 150 equations. So it, it requires a lot of time. And, and now we have computer si uh, like computers, but, but if you think about when CGEs were developed in the early uh, uh, 50s and 60s and 70s, and the same goes with post keynesian models, the, the computational power was low, and you didn't have the time, you, you, you couldn't really go into these detail. And so I don't, I don't know if it was a theoretical decision or if it was a practical decision, but in the end, it was just simpler, and you could do it. No, we don't have to. So, the, and I think the, 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 the dynamics we have are more uh, uh, relevant because of these both price and quantity uh, 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 movements. Because it's not one or the other, it's actually the two at the same time. Yeah? Okay. Um, the transition and the co-benefits of the transition, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so why do they have these uh, negative impacts on the mainstream? It's because theoretically, if you are the optimum, by definition, anything you do to change the optimum has to be negative because you cannot be at the optimum again. Um, uh, so, so this is why if you look at all of the mainstream, they always try to find what they call co-benefits. They say, yeah, you're gonna have less GDP, but then better health, or uh, but then you will have uh, other aspects that are nice. Uh, and that are coming because you did the transition. But these will compensate the fact that you lost in the transition, which again is completely stupid because you are not at full capacity, um, you have unemployment, uh, and you are not in an optimum position where the economic system is efficient. Actually, if you look at the case of Morocco, doing the transition is economically more interesting because you, you, you will gain from the imports more than the cost of the transition. So, so th that discourse is changing slowly, also because the problem is that if you keep by saying, oh, the transition is bad, but yeah, you will have co-benefits, no one is listening to you. Um, so, so that discourse is changing. Um, it's still very much present, and I had a very interesting discussion with Banque de France last week with a modeler, and he was doing DSGE, and I was showing that our model was leading to inflation because you had extra capacity and so on. And he was coming to say, but how and why? And I was basically explaining to him that the problem is that if you, if you start from a wrong representation of the, of the current situation, any policy implication that you make on this wrong representation will lead to a realistic outcome. And they know, right? So they look at the outcome of the DSGE model and they don't, it doesn't make any sense. But it's not because the shock is not badly designed, it's because fundamentally you are starting from a situation which is not a good representation of the reality. So you know that in France right now, if you invest in a massive, in a low carbon transition and massively invest in retrofitting houses and building ph uh, photovoltaics and so on, it will have a positive impact directly, not indirectly over the time. It's, it's directly investment and so on and so forth. And that's, that's, that's precluded from the model. So, this is, I think this is, it's the, it's, the, it's the framework in which you are. And because countries know that that framework is not really, I mean, if you go to, to finance ministries and so on, they know the limitations of the model they have. So they know that if the bank, the World Bank comes and say, oh, but your transition is gonna be difficult in the beginning, but then you will win. They say, no, no, it's actually, it's gonna be directly interesting. And so that they know. So, so that discourse has changed uh, over the time. And, and even the discourse of the nodos, you know, oh, it's, it's good to do the transition, no, even if it's costly, because in the long run you avoid damages. Everyone knows that actually doing the transition no is interesting, because there's massive in, uh, investment decision to be made. Yeah. Okay, so you are about to become mainstream, right? Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, here. here. Hello, um, I'm Jan from Germany. Uh, I have two questions, a bit more technical. First of all, uh, regarding data collection. So we saw that the model requires a lot of a lot more inputs, and then during the course of the presentation, I was wondering where do you get data for that? For example, the the, the time it takes for the prices or uh, um, um, quantities to adjust in different sectors, or the impact on portfolio decisions. How hard is it to find data on that? And how much do you have to compromise? What is even uh, um, um, quantifiable and whatnot? Um, and the second question is regarding in-house modeling. So what do you think, what's, what are like kind of the, the costs and benefits of um, modeling everything 
yourself instead of just giving it to McKinsey. Like, <laughs> are there are there better diffusion effects? Like, do other um, agencies profit from that more than as well? Or how how hard is it for the agencies to get all the researchers to produce your own models? What's your opinion on that? Okay. Just one there, and then okay, Aaron. Yeah. Hello, Caroline from Germany. Um, thank you also from me. Um, I have a bit more <coughs> applied question um, because you said yourself these models are very much a simplification of reality. And so your um, your policy recommendation at the end is like, okay, Colombia could diversify its exports. How much of a simplification of reality is this? Like, is this something that you realistically see happening? Are there first steps in this direction? Yeah, what what are the next steps to do sort of one for Colombia, but also from like the global international community to help not only Colombia, but generally the countries that are most affected, yeah, in, in these next steps? Yeah. Okay, there was another question. Yeah. Um, How do you, uh, Matthias uh, from France? You mentioned that you had partnerships with uh, some of the countries you work on. Um, my question was, uh, how do you choose uh, the countries uh, you will work on? Because there are like 200,000 countries <laughs> in the world, and most of them are developing countries that are, could be the subject uh, of your research. So how do you choose the country you focus on? And is this kind of methodology can or can it could it also be applied to developed countries such mm. as France or any other one? Thank you. Okay. And I say I take the third round right after the three four minutes. Shh. Okay, so I have to be fast. Um, data collection. Um, so yeah, it is quite data intensive. Um, uh, the data comes from national accounts, from uh, the central banks, uh, supervision like regulators and so on. Um, a bit of international data. It is um, somewhat complicated to get uh, this data. Um, I mean, in certain countries, you just don't have the data, and then we don't do the model. Uh, like, you've seen Ivory Coast. In the case of Ivory Coast, we couldn't do something like we did in, in Colombia. So it was a much, much simpler model, because simply just there's no data in there. Uh, in, in emerging economies, you find, I mean, in Colombia, we had fun. Uh, because it was it was complicated to get some of the data sets. Uh, in other countries, it's much easier. Um, but yeah, so generally speaking, it's actually it's somewhat complicated, but not too complicated. Uh, in South Africa, for example, we're doing one right now. It's it's super simple. Um, Turkey is a bit more complicated. So it depends. It it, it really depends. Um, do we ha do we all have to find compromise? Yes, uh, we do. We have developed also a lot of tools to uh, overcome some of the limitations. So I won't go into details, but, but part of the, the reason, and it's, it allows me to go to the in-house modeling question, which was, uh, it was you as well, <laughs> there you go. Um, so, so, so the fact that we do in-house allows us to actually uh, uh, control the entire supply chain of the model, right? So, so, so when we are doing a partnership with the country, we can go to see the statistical offices, we can go to see the central bank, uh, and we come with the, our own answers to the question, like methodologies to the question that we might raise. So, so to me, that's that's one thing. It allows us to have a much more complete model. And if you were to say to give it to McKinsey, PwC, or whatnot, because they would just basically find some data somewhere and then just produce a result. The second point about the in-house modeling is that it depends on whether you do modeling for the sake of modeling or for transformative purposes. If you're doing it for transformative purposes, you have to make sure that your model is being used. I've done, when I was in, in academia before, I have done lots of model, beautiful model, much more better published and with very prestigious people. In the end, these models are not being used. So, so you want to, be, to make sure that when you develop your model, you develop with someone who is going to use it afterwards. And it's a key aspect of our partnership is that in the end, we want to make sure that when we leave, because AFD has to leave, because it, it's not fair that France is coming and say, oh, you know what, I'm going to give you a model and I choose to whom I give it. It, it. The idea is that we shouldn't exist in the long term because there's no reason why France would be more adequate to do modeling than others. So, so you have to actually really make sure that as you construct the model, you do the relevant model with the right perspective 
on this in the relevant answer the relevant question, but also ensure that the, the countries don't need us in the medium to long run. And so, 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 so that's why I think in-house, you cannot do that, we've tried. And even with academic partners from France, it doesn't work like that. They, there is, you, you have to make sure, I have the WhatsApp of all of the partners in the countries and they contact with me at any time. You wouldn't get that with a, a consultancy firm for sure, but even with academia because it's, academics produce models to publish them. We produce models to use them. And that's a very fundamental difference in this. So this is why we're doing it. And I think it's extremely relevant for EFD to do that. It gives them a different perspective. And it's on modeling, but it's on other aspects. I have a colleague working on inequality and the same. The idea is we do in-house. Not everything has to be done in-house, of course, but, but what we do in-house is because we want to make sure that it has a transformative aspect. Um, yeah, what kind of policy recommendation and so on? Well, there's two aspects. The first one is that that the fact that the model exists and shows that you have to take into consideration the real and financial in interactions is already something quite important. No one before, in the case of Colombia, actually I even saw something worse. The central bank did try to publish a paper, I saw it because there was a reviewer, uh, a paper where they were saying, yeah, Colombia can survive no problem with loss of exports of uh, fossil fuels. Because in your general equilibrium framework, yeah, you just have a relative price change, and so yeah, you export less of this fossil fuel, but somehow something else, like the Armington process I was describing I don't like, will work. And there is no financial repercussion of this. So, so the fact that the model exists and highlights the fact that there is a dependency to financial flows or highlights the fact that yeah, there is a dependency to fossil fuel also for FDI or also for dividends and, and uh, royalties, already provides a different insight which allows Colombia to be more relevant in policy design. Of course, the response that we gave in terms of policy recommendation is limited, but that's just because we stopped there. We, I mean, we, but then the next step is indeed to look at, so what we do, we're doing right now is looking at the energy transformation of the Colombian economy and we're doing something about innovation and productivity change. So that's something on the next step. Uh, but again, the fact that Colombia, that, that what we are saying about Colombia is relevant also allows other countries to say, hey, you know what, in my case, it's also relevant. And I might, I'm, so, so it's, this is why I'm saying that the model itself is transformative. It's not necessarily about the policy recommendation. It's the fact that the model shows relevant dynamics to the country, which allows the country then to say, you know what, maybe that policy recommendation that I will implement a carbon tax, no matter what, is, is completely idiotic. Carbon tax will not do the transition. And that's actually an exercise we do in Colombia, where we show that the carbon tax will not lead to any transformation of the economy because what you need is building capacity to produce low carbon energy, not taxing carbon tax, uh, carbon. Anyway, so, so you see, so, so it is true that in the current setup, the policy recommendation that comes out of the model is are limited, but I think it's not because the policy recommendation are relevant, it's because the model is relevant and it's transformative. Okay. Um, and then how do we choose countries? Yeah, this is, uh, this is the sausage part of the story. You don't know how to produce sausages, yeah? Well, this, you don't know. <laughs> AFD, AFD has a strategy um, coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and coming from business prospects. And so there's a list of priority countries and we as researchers respond to that priority. I'm being extremely blunt here, but uh, this is how it really happened. It, it is a combination of one, the country has to be important for AFD from a business slash uh, diplomatic perspective and the country has to desire. We had the case in the, uh, with India where we were discussing with the planning department and they were saying, oh yeah, we're interested in having GEM, but then you do it and you just deliver the, the model to us. And we said, no, we don't work like that. So, so if you want to work with us on GEM, we co-construct the model. Otherwise, then you can do it with any consultancy firm and that's fine. You will have a model description and so on. So you see, this is, this is part of the, the, the finding the country. So, so it, it's really about whether the country is strategic, whether there's a desire from the country, whether there's capacity and data in the model, in the country and so on and so forth. So it's a process. So in the case of Colombia, it took me a year between the moment when there was a demand from, a, from the, industry of, uh, the, the Ministry of uh, um, uh, Environment saying, oh, we'd like to do a gem, it took me a year to design the project before we actually launched it. So it takes time. So, so this is why this, this, the selection process is, is, uh, is quite complicated. I don't know if I answered completely your, your, your question. Yeah. Can it be developed, uh, applied to developed countries? Yes, definitely. Uh, and it should. 
uh, certainly. There is, I mean, of course, it's not in the mandate of AFD, but there's similar models developed. Uh, for example, there's a, a project called Locomotion, uh, funded by the EU, which is doing something similar to GEM. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's based in, in Portugal and Spain. Uh, there's the, uh, the EU Green model in Siena with Alessandro, Simone D'Alessandro. Um, there's Yanis da Fermos doing SFC environmental model applied to Europe. Um, so there's plenty of these kinds of models. They're not all in, in, in continuous time. I think the continuous time adds some, some important features, but, but still, uh, they're interesting models. And yeah, we could apply them to, um, to other countries. Exactly, yeah, see? Okay, okay. Um, Julio from Mexico. Hi. Uh, so two questions, but yeah, it, they are a bit off topic and a bit very specific. So I don't know, but I will. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, first of all, I was wondering, uh, like, how what is your reading of, uh, like, the last like AMLO's policy, like the president of Mexico regarding fossil fuels and the not energy transition uh which is weird but yeah like what is your reading and second of all uh i was interested on the project that you um, talk about with banco de mexico uh, can you share what are you doing with them and yeah just that okay one question so how many questions one two three oh my god okay okay so quick question okay okay then, then we will Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Actually, this is one of the few presentations uh, that are actually about something real that's happening in the world in, when it comes to economics. Thank you very much. I'm really impressed. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, you touched upon very briefly about the, 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 the consequences of the crisis, Russian-Ukraine crisis, mm. and how it led to the inflation that people did not expect. Could you go a little bit deeper on that? please because you were really brief and it was like like an edge. yeah so, thank you uh, Camille from France uh, thank you for your presentation uh, I have a question because for me there is a con contradiction uh, between the need to industrialize but currently the industries rely a lot on energy intensive mm. also um, really like water intensive and they can also lead to a loss of biodiversity and so on so how can we how can developing country do that? Like it's okay. Uh, okay, there and there. We will take. There are three. Uh, hello, uh, Rashid from Afghanistan. Uh, at some point in your presentation, you have discussed uh, um, global inflation, uh, food inflation rate, uh, and also the um, short uh, shortage of food in the future as a result of. Um, uh, global uh, transition uh, on ecolo ecological transition. I was um, wondering about an alternative scenario of um, global north and south um, cooperation, where the global north could invest in global south in terms of uh, in, on crops and agricultural products, where it could be beneficial for both sides. We know that specific uh, geographical locations have are more fruitful lands than some others. How do you think this scenario could be much helpful in terms of keeping this inflation rate stable and also solving this um, uh, food shortage in the future as a result of global ecological transition? Philip from Germany again. Um, I want to ask uh, which framework do you use to uh, implement technological change and productivity growth in this model? You skipped over that, but probably you can elaborate a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but then the time will be up, so we we'll just leave and leave the question open. Maybe you might want to. Hi, I'm Yaksh, I'm from India. Um, I don't really want to make this sound provocative because it's something that I also, and I think most of us uh, deal with, but as post-Keynesian scholars or just non-mainstream Are you calling me post-Keynesian? No, <laughs> that's exactly where, what I was getting to because as, as non-mainstream scholars, there's kind of this moral high ground that 
uh, we all kind of have because we're dealing with more important issues. Uh, and just the fact that, you know, uh, we commented on saying like, we can't be like Nordhaus, you know, it's kind of like symbolic of what I'm trying to get at. But um, what, I, what I deal with every time I come across something like this is as a global North country, uh, one of the things that is very easily arguable is that something that is stopping the global South is access to technology is access to a um, sophisticated methodology like GEM, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but there's kind of like this internal contradiction when you say that applying this model to countries is driven by foreign policy decisions or by this kind of like diplomatic priorities. Um, I am not sure and I would like to know how you reconcile this with kind of like a greater good responsibility that mm -hmm. ecological economics has. Also because it's a minority discipline in economics, uh, very few people talk about it and very few, even fewer get successful talking about it. Um, so I would just like to know how you reconcile that. Yeah, thanks. Oh, there's one more, okay. Yes. Last. Hello to Bias from Austria. I wanted to ask you if you also see something positive in the green transition in Colombia since I uh, read a lot about it, how like the oil sector like keeps manifesting social structures that prevents Colombia from um, uh, diversification in, in its exports. So if you see a chance there to also like work, go that way. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, there is, okay. Oh, there's there one more. One. <laughs> you have three minutes to answer. You will have just two, two minutes. minutes. Now I'll be, I'll be fast. Let it I have a question about, you uh, mentioned, uh, for, I'm sorry, my name is Stefan, I'm from Denmark. Uh, you mentioned something about forecasting and such, which is ex in itself an extremely difficult uh, thing to do. But I was also curious, because do you have the assumption that labor is interchangeable? Because in the coming future of the technological advances, many of the production capacities of these countries is going to be ceased to be relevant in the export realm. Yeah. So have you considered, like, if you're an investor and you invest into a foreign country, you often look at the labor pool and the, and the abilities. So maybe what I'm proffering here is a potential expansion of your model where you also include like the necessity of higher uh, investment into specific educational levels. And that could then in turn reap some rewards. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Okay. Um, I, I don't like being short. Uh, <laughs> in time, not... <laughs> Um, so about uh, about Mexico, um, yeah, it's difficult to comment on the on the AMLO. It's of course it's uh, Mexico. Uh, AMLO is is odd, uh, lefty but somewhat conservative on the on the fossil fuel, which is surprising because compared to Colombia, Mexico is not as dependent on on fossil fuel extraction. The economy is much more diversified. So there's no. I mean, in Colombia, I would understand why you would say no. You can't get out of it because. I mean, fundamentally, it's fifty percent of exports. It's 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 a serious shock. In the case of of Mexico, it's less less so. I, so I don't know. I don't know what what causes that. I heard that his new candidate is more open to environmental aspects. Yeah, but it's unclear, right? So, uh, what is surprising is uh, is that Banxico, the central bank, is actually more active. On, on the energy transition and the biodiversity protection than, than the ministry. And this is with them that we work. So good luck, for, <laughs> that's good for us. Um, so yeah, uh, we, can, we can talk about it if you want later in, in, in more details. Um, uh, inflation, um, so, so when, I, I don't know if you remember, but uh, back in the days when the Ukraine war started, uh, there was a lot of discussion, okay, oh, uh, energy, can we do without energy? Are we going to have blackouts and so on and so forth? And, and no one talked about the inflationary pressure that would come out of it. No one, literally. Like, I remember, and then everyone was saying, oh, we're going to have blackouts, blackouts, blackouts. We didn't have the blackouts, but in the end, we had massive inflation and persistent one, which triggered, triggered afterwards the, the profit-led inflation. No one was mentioning this. And I think it's because it's not in the, in the, in the framework of developed economies' uh, uh, modeling capacities. If you look at all of these 
they, no one thinks about it. It's, and, and, and they couldn't even foresee that it would be permanent because the price of energy has gone down and yet you still have inflation. And that's because it has been wiped out out of the, the economic thinking in the global north um, because you simply didn't have inflation for 30 years. Uh, and you had spikes, but then they would go back afterwards. And, and, and that requires having a specific type of model which explains inflation not only by the output gap, but by other costs and other aspects such as profit-driven inflation and so on and so forth. So to me, this is really important. And, and yeah, so this is why I think no one did, did foresee this. And the same goes with the food industry and the food uh, question there. Um, so yeah, again, uh, it's interesting because the Ukraine war, I was looking at, I was, I'm working in Morocco and Tunisia, and the Ukraine war started just before Ramadan. And the, you had the high increase in the price of cereals and other food uh, stuff, which were massively imported in Morocco and Tunisia. They actually, to, to, because it was Ramadan and they couldn't have inflation during that period, they actually had to subsidize. So, so to me, it's really important to understand indeed that inflationary pressure need to be incorporated because it has repercussion income distribution, but also in terms of fiscal or, or public, uh, public expenditure. Can we have a sort of a agricultural planification. Theoretically, theoretically, yes. What we see, all of the biophysical models say that there is no reason why we would have food scarcity. There's enough food to be produced right now, as we speak, without even an, a transition and whatnot, definitely. Um, the problem is not so much about the fact that you can produce, it's about the distribution of food and the consequences. And if you are in a country in the global south that produces a lot of food but has low value added and you have to import all of your capital in exchange for selling your food, there's no development going on there. So, so to me, yes, uh, having a more el uh, elaborate uh, uh, agricultural production plan and so on is, is important, but it's as important as talking about industrialization and making sure that you actually give the capacity to countries to really develop and not maintain them in a state of dependency. And that's currently what's going on in, in, in the current uh, uh, trade situation. The global south is stuck into a sort of a dependency, not not everyone. China is, of course, uh, very different. Well, India is very different to that aspect. But still, uh, there is some sort of a, of a, of a power relationship uh, between the global north and the global south. And so assuming that you only deal with food without taking into consideration the rest is problematic. So it has to be part of it, but it has to be accompanied with other industry story. And that allows me to move to the industry question. Yes, it's a, it's a very good point. What is important to me is that when we talk about industrialization, we really talk about industrialization in the global south. So you want to make sure that the global south and countries individually or in regions are producing the things that they need for themselves and don't stay dependent on the global north to provide them with fancy goods and selling commodities in exchange. So that's the issue. Whether you have to have green, green industrialization in the global north, that's a different question. I think you should reduce your capacity of production, stop producing useless things, and produce more important things. So this is where you have to have this kind of a dematerialization of the economy. Make sure you reduce the material footprint. And that implies reducing some of the useless production in, in the north and, and maybe shift part of the production. So, so the industrialization is, to me, is really something about, in general, about developing and emerging economies, which also implies that something has to happen also in the north, because you can't have everyone industrializing, and industrializing, because then you will have a problem of, of why are we producing stuff. But it's, it's, it has to be about reducing your material footprint in general, and, and having a more equal exchange uh, in there. And you can go and read Hickel and so on about the degrowth movement and the post-growth movement and so on uh, on this. Um, technological change and productivity, so we have cost share uh, induced technological change um, and uh, with a dependency on imports to have cap uh, productivity gains. So, so we have a theory of change of the productivity where at the beginning it's trade which is uh, uh, leading to, um, to, to productivity uh, imports uh, and then it comes to FDI and then it comes to joint venture. Uh, and, and if you're interested, we can discuss about this. Uh, and Eric M. Benedict is, is the guy with whom we work on this, and he's actually um, uh, quite interesting. Uh, there's one question there, but I think I responded to all of the questions. So it's your question about uh, no uh, positive about uh, yeah sorry positive about Colombia. So yeah, um, what about m uh, my positioning uh, uh, <laughs> as post Keynesian and so on? Um, mm 
I, I don't know how to answer that in a, in a, in a two minutes. <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I'm aware of my positionality. I, I know that, that I'm coming, I'm a white heterosexual, 40 years old with two kids from the global north. And so I know that my positioning is, is, is as such, is biased. Um, and so, so yeah, yeah I, I, I need, we need to have a longer discussion and, and probably beers uh, to, uh, <laughs> to go further on this. So I'll, I'll, I'll use my joker on that one, but we can, I, we can it's, 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 let's have a longer discussion. Uh, I don't want to avoid the question. I, I, I just don't know how to respond it into a short, short period of time. Um, something positive about the green transition in Colombia. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, I, I think that what is important, especially with transition, is that you have to have an ambition. So, so acknowledging the issues and Acknowledging the complexity of what you want to do is often sufficient to actually start a tipping point uh, dynamics. So, so I think uh, the government Petro is actually doing that. And there's a lot of questions we can have on whether it's doing good things or bad things and so on. But, but uh, on that aspect saying, okay, well, we are going to stick with the fact that we have to remove our dependency to fossil fuel. We are going to protect our biodiversity. We want to have a more inclusive society. To me, that's important. And, and there are opportunities. Now, there's also a lot of uh, 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 hurdles and a lot of inertia in the system which might make it not work or might make it work. But symbolically, I think Colombia was very important in COP saying, well, I am a fossil fuel exporter and I'm saying we have to exit fossil fuels. That's fundamental. I mean, so, so the fact that Colombia was saying this is more important than France is doing this because France, of course, is importing fossil fuel. So it's easy for them to say, we le we let's get out. And he didn't even say that. <laughs> but, but in the case of Colombia, this is like, to me, symbolics are very important. And that symbolic from, from Colombia was fundamental. So I think it might create something positive, but it's not given. And, and it, he might not be reelected. And in that case, I don't know what's going to happen afterwards. Um, yeah, labor, it's a, it's, a, it's a very important question. We don't treat labor well. Um, this is typical in macro model. It's, it's wrong. Uh, we should work about this, but you have to go at the sectoral level. And there's a problem, especially when it comes to these kind of models, that the data that you need, like you would need to have a detailed uh, skill set by sector uh, analysis that allows you to say, okay, if we change the structure, then we will need these more of these kind of uh, employment, these kind of employment. And that, in the model currently, it's, it's, it's completely impossible. In the future, it might be, uh, but we need to, to develop further the methodology. It's not ready yet. We can do it ex post. That's possible, right? So you do a, a more of a normative scenario. And then at the end, you say, OK, oh, we know that these sectors will grow, this sector will degrow. So that implies that we would need more of these kind of skills and that kind of skills, but it's ex post. Uh, but that's still important. And again, as I said, it gives you an ambition. You say, okay, we are going to need more of these. And that's very important for countries. In the case of Colombia, we had a discussion about the green transition and what kind of employment would be, what kind of jobs would be created and hence what kind of training you would need. And yeah, and then, then you have capacity building and I so on. Rather key for the whole just argument yes. for actually expanding the export and you know, like moving away yeah. from this industrialized, you know, and it would also, you know, yeah, you I agree. I completely agree. Uh, it, it just it takes time. Give us some time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.